Hi, my name's Dave, and in this video we'll walk through work example 9.1 on the accounting for cash flow and fair value hedges. I'll assume you have it with you. Before we begin, a quick overview of the scenario. The company, EasyBits Industries, is an Australian-based importer. Its board has a low risk tolerance and have a risk management strategy to hedge all foreign currency purchases over $1 million. EasyBits has a 30 June year end. On the 30th November 2000X6, EasyBits makes a firm commitment to purchase 5 million euro worth of furniture on the 31st of March 2000X7. Given its risk management strategy, it also enters into a forward foreign exchange contract to hedge the FX risk of the purchase. This contract with Aurora Bank is for EasyBits to receive 5 million euro and pay 7,812,500 on the 31st of March 2007. The bank involved is AA plus rated by Standard & Poor's throughout the term of the forward contract. There is also substantial hedge documentation, an extract of which you have. At inception, EasyBits' treasurer is satisfied a hedging relationship will result in hedge accounting because a. there is a strong economic relationship between the FX forward and the underlying FX risk, b. the hedging relationship is not dominated by credit risk, and c. the hedge ratio used for accounting purposes is the same as that resulting from the actual hedge. We're also ignoring tax here. The task is to prepare the journal entries to account for the hedged item and the hedging instrument for the year ended 30th of June 2007 based on categorizing the hedging relationship as a fair value hedge and as a cash flow hedge. The final part of the task is to compare the financial statement impacts of the two methods. To assist with this, Additional information on the spot exchange rates and fair values of the firm commitment and FX forward are provided. For our purposes, we're not interested in how these fair values came about, just the fact that we have them. The first step should be to review IFRS 9, which is a good place to start because the standards pertaining to financial instruments are lengthy and it's easy to miss something. The second step is to apply the requirements of IFRS 9 to the hedging relationship. We're assuming here that the hedge can be accounted for as if it was effective for its entire life. Step three relates to the accounting required on the 30th of November 2007 for a fair value hedge. This is the date the firm commitment and the forward were entered into. There is no entry for the firm commitment as there has been no transaction. It is an unrecognized firm commitment. For the FX forward, the fair value is zero as the value of the 5 million euros to be received is equal at this time to the value of the Aussie payment of $7,812,500. As such, no entry is required either. Step 4 takes place on the semi-annual report date of the 31st of December 2006. On this date, we've been provided information that the fair value of the firm commitment is $7,692,308, a reduction of 120,192 since the 30th of November 2000X6. Even though the firm commitment itself isn't recognized, if a firm commitment is being hedged, then the change does get accounted for. For fair value hedges, we adjust the carrying amount of the hedged item, in this case the unrecognized firm commitment, and recognize any gain or loss in profit or loss. As the firm commitment is reducing in value, this is a debit to fair value of hedging, the account we're using in relation to the firm commitment, for 120192 and credit gain on firm commitment, 120192 We're also providing information that the fair value of the FX forward is negative 131000 a reduction of 131000 this has come about because the Aussie has strengthened against the euro, so the, so the Aussie value of the 5 million euro that EasyBits will receive is now worth less than the 7,812,500 they agreed to pay for it. To account for the hedging instrument, the hedging instrument carrying value is adjusted and any change is recognized in profit or loss. So the entry here is a debit loss on FX forward 131,000 and credit FX forward 131,000. The FX forward goes onto the balance sheet. You will notice that the change in value of the forward and firm commitment didn't exactly match. 
This $10,808 difference has now been recognized in profit and loss as, a, as hedge in effectiveness due to the two journals you've just posted. Step five and the final step for fair value hedging is the entry that takes place on the 31st of March, 2000X7. The first thing we do here is to repeat the process from the previous date, but with updated information. With the Aussie weakening against the Euro, the fair value of the firm commitment has increased to $8,333,333. On the 31st of December, it was valued at $7,692,308. This means the value of the firm commitment has increased $641,025 in the last three months. As this is an expected increase in the cost of inventory for EasyBits, this isn't good for them. The hedged item's carrying value is adjusted and any gain or loss is recognized in profit or loss. The entry for this is debit loss $641,025 and the fair value of hedging is credited the same. The FX forward increases in value to $525,000. This represents an asset as the euro that EasyBits will receive from Aurora as part of the FX forward are worth more than the Aussie EasyBits is required to pay. To adjust the FX forward from a credit balance of 131,000 to a debit balance of 525,000 requires a $656,000 debit to the FX forward account. As before, any change goes to profit or loss, and in this case, it's a gain on FX forward for $656,000. We then need to finalize the inventory purchase and close out the forward. On this date, the inventory is purchased for 5 million euro, which, with an exchange rate of 0.6, means $8,333,333. Thus, debit inventory $8,333,333 and credit cash at bank $8,333,333. For the FX forward, the two parties, EasyBits and Aurora, don't in fact exchange 5 million euros and 7,812,500 dollars. Rather, the net difference is paid from one party. In this case, it's EasyBit who has come out better on the deal, and so will receive 525,000 dollars from Aurora, which is a fair value of the FX forward. And whilst we're nearly done, there is one final transaction, and that is to deal with the fair value of hedging account which is sitting on the balance sheet. Once the purchase of inventory transaction has been settled, this gets transferred against the value of the inventory. Currently, the fair value of hedging has a credit balance of 520,833, which means to bring that down to zero, we need to debit the account 520,833. The credit is to inventory. The result of this is whilst the inventory was purchased for $8,333,333, it is recorded in the books at that amount less $520,833, which equals $7,812,500, the value agreed in the FX forward. Hedge ineffectiveness of 4167 due to the cumulative difference in fair values between the firm commitment and the FX forward, has been recognized as income. And that covers accounting for fair value hedging. We'll now turn our attention to cash flow hedging. We're looking at the entries as at the 30th of November 2000X6. This works just the same as for fair value hedging. There's nothing to do here and for the same reason. Moving now to the 31st of December 2000X6. The first thing to do is to find the fair value of the hedging instrument the FX forward, and this we have. It's negative 131,000. This is then recognized through a credit entry to the FX forward of $131,000. The second thing to do is to apply the lower of rule from IFRS 9, paragraph 6511. This effectively petitions the change in value of the FX forward into the effective and ineffective portions of the hedge. The effective portion gets taken to OCI, whilst the ineffective portion goes to profit or loss. The OCI component is the lower of, in absolute terms, of the cumulative gain or loss on the hedging instrument, the FX forward, and the cumulative change in fair value of the hedged item, the firm commitment. The cumulative change in the FX forward is $131,000, whilst the cumulative change in the firm commitment is $131,000. 
$120,092. As $120,092 is a lower amount, this is the effective portion and is debited to the cash flow hedge reserve, an OCI account, whilst the remainder, $10,808, is debited to the P&L as the ineffective component. Step 8 covers entries on the 30th of March 2007. We repeat the process from step 7. The FX forward is now worth $525,000, so requires a debit of $656,000 to adjust it from a credit balance of $131. The second thing to do is to apply the lower of rule to find the effective and ineffective portions of the hedge. The cumulative change in the FX forward is $525,000 whilst the cumulative change in the firm commitment is 520,833. 520,833 is the lower amount. This is a new balance of the cash flow hedge reserve. As this account currently has a $120,192 debit balance in it, a credit of $641,025 is required to make the adjustment. The difference between the $656,000 debit and the $641,025 credit is a credit of $14,975, which is the ineffective portion of the hedge. The inventory is purchased and accounted for as previously, and the FX forward is closed out and accounted for just as previously. Similarly to the final entry for the fair value hedging, the balance of the cash flow hedge reserve is transferred to inventory. This results in a debit cash flow hedge reserve 520,833 and credit inventory 520,833. Note, it could also have gone direct to the income statement in the period the inventory is sold. As with the fair value hedge, the cash flow hedge leads to inventory being recorded in the books at $7,812,500. The final step is to compare the two methods. So first, the treatment of the forward. The forward gets accounted for in the same way for both methods. Whatever the fair value of the forward is at the date of the entry is what the balance of the forward needs to be in the balance sheet. Second, the treatment of the firmed commitment. This is where the main difference is. Under the fair value method, the fair value of the firm commitment is recognized in the balance sheet, whereas for the cash flow method, the fair value of the firm commitment is recognized in OCI. Third, profit or loss effects. The net effect on profit or loss is the same for each method. However, the entries required are slightly different. For the fair value method, this is by offsetting gains and losses on the hedging instrument and hedged item, whilst for the cash flow hedge, it is the ineffective portion of the hedge which goes into profit or loss. And with that, we have now walked through work example 9.1. I hope that that helped.